Blended Podcasts. Brought to you by Blended Audio. Hello listeners, thank you for tuning in and welcome back to Talos Talks Shit. We are really talking some shit here about some high level high level shit. Some avant-garde shit. <laughs> um, about the nature of reality and the nature of perception of reality. And is reality really real? Uh, it's quite a lot to get into now, but please go listen to our last two episodes. Uh, they explain this in a lot more detail, but basically we're at the point where we don't necessarily we can't necessarily say that what we perceive is the actual reality so this consensus of objects in space and time we've come to as a species is simply the most efficient way for us to perceive all the information that exists around us that information being um, mathematical and physical information in terms of physics and quantum physics and that these uh, consensuses aren't real and puppy's nodding his head yeah uh, yeah yeah dog real, we and them. this is a this is a theory by a guy called donald hoffman again last two episodes really dive into this into a lot more detail but let's continue so we, we sit at the point where either we take the path of biology where we say that this uh consensus of reality we have arrived upon is real is somehow real and that our brain somehow perceives real objects and space-time. Yeah. Or we take the other path and we take the Donald Hoffman sort of quantum physical view that nothing is real. Everything is simply a collection of particles and subatomic particles that need to be measured by an observer in order to exist. It's the observer problem, you know? Um, I wouldn't necessarily classify it. I would just say more like he says that I think like the best analogy is just to keep going back to that desktop analogy. So that's just like he, he believes that whatever we experience in the world is an evolutionary interface that protects us from a far more complicated back end. Exactly. So, so the idea of dragging a file into the trash can on a desktop that has no relation to what's actually happening with inside the PC when you do that. Yeah. Same yeah. with our perception of reality. But saying that um, quantum nature of reality could, could be the actual pixels that make up that yeah. user interface. Yeah. You know what I mean? Because yeah. you have pixels that make up the image of the file and the image of the trash can. Those pixels could be particles and subatomic particles. Mm. Mm. That's I. It's like mm. it's crazy. So the one thing that I'll say about that that like I've been thinking about for a while and really like messes me up is that a lot of our physics is based off um, like primitives and axioms like time, right? If you're gonna calculate the velocity of a particle, that's delta x over delta t. But you need t to exist to calculate yeah. delta t, right? And that's defined as Newtonian physics. Yeah, that's but like just. Even if, like, so for example, in quantum mechanics, right, um, if you're going to calculate for example, oh, say, for example, general relativity, right, the speed of light, right, right. that uh, you need time. Time is always embedded into the framework somehow. But once you say that, so as he does, that space and time are just really a user interface, what it means is that, like, a lot of our physics and a lot of the things that we understand are um, kind of like also part of this interface. For example, if time doesn't exist, you can't calculate the speed of light. So maybe what what's happening is that because physics works. Physics, yeah. physics works, dude. Yeah. That's why we can fly to the moon and that's yeah. why we have cell phones and also yeah. well, everything basically is thanks to physics. Yeah. But I agree. Physics works. Physics does work. <laughs> and we can fight us, guys. <laughs> yeah, I think we can arrive at that conclusion. Yeah. But what it could be is that our understanding of physics is maybe like level one yeah. of the, the user interface. So now instead of just dragging the file into the trash can, we've opened 
a command prompt and we can go we can type in the c command to yeah. drag the file into the mm. trash can but that still doesn't necessarily let us know how the silicon chip works That's a how really the data good analogy, is all right thank That's you a super dope analogy. thank you um so to progress past yeah. level one we would need to throw, according to Don Hoffman, we would need to, and some quantum physicists, quite a lot of quantum physicists. This is the interesting thing, is that quantum physicists and evolutionary biologists fundamentally differ you know, yeah. at the moment in terms of their, their understanding of the perception of the world. Yeah, I was, what do you mean by fundamentally differ? Well, biologists have a um, sort of, what do I call it? Um, a physical reality understa- understanding of the world where okay. they, they believe that objects do exist in a certain way and oh, that I our see. brain perceives those objects in a certain way and that our brain is a real thing. <laughs> yeah. Whereas quantum physicists uh, may believe that, you know, objects don't actually exist. Mm. They're simply observed um, and that our brain isn't actually real. And they're also uh, working at different scales, right? Like a, a biologist is working with like protein molecules and he's working with like organic chemistry. Quantum effects really become very prominent when you start looking at subatomic particles. Exactly. And it's, I think it's called the hierarchy problem. It's a, it's a problem uh, of how do you move? It's, it's, a, it's a big, uh, I, I don't know if unsolved problem is the word for problems in physics, but it's a, uh, the question is how do you move from quantum effects that are really weird and very mm. unintuitive to things like organic chemistry and yeah. biology where they work in a much more classical manner. This, so this is what something I've been thinking about for a long time is that, like I was saying in the previous episodes, you know, these uh, archetypal subconscious things we have as society, subconscious archetypes we have as societies, um, may exist in a realm that's part of the hierarchy problem. You know what I mean? It's, oh. uh, we have the same difficulty going from quantum physics to organic chemistry as we would have the difficulty going from this somewhat ethereal realm of archetypes and uh, collective subconscious going potentially, maybe that's, you know, maybe mm. it's it's like organic chemistry in the sense is level one. Um, Subquantum, sub subatomic quantum physics is level two, mm-hmm. and then maybe level three is beginning to understand some sort of a deeper layer of reality that allows us to all arrive at this consensus. Because there, there must be some. I, I can't believe that it's simply because of natural selection that we've all arrived at the same consensus. Mu- Mike, what do you mean by the same quote? You mean like uh, we all see the same stuff? We yeah, exactly. Like- exactly. We all see the same things. You know what I mean? Okay. And it goes beyond humans. Like if me and you are sitting together and we see a rat climb up the stairs, that rat isn't a human. So it's not necessarily perceiving the stairs in a human centric way, but it still has to exert the energy to go up them, mm. meaning there's still an mm. obstacle in its way. Mm. And there must be some sort of reason why both us at the same time see the rat doing the same thing and the rat itself totally separate from human centric consciousness does the thing we're seeing you know what i mean everyone's in agreement on the staircase and on the fact that there's motion yeah you know and i can't believe that's just a a function of natural selection i feel like there has to be some sort of i will say that don hoffman um he actually says that so for example it's not that you get to like like it's not like your illusion creates reality because that's like a i think like a misnomer a lot of people mm. will like will be like well mm. you basically just say we imagine what's real mm. and he he does believe that there is some so for example imagine the stairs were actually some weird five-dimensional vector yeah. right uh, let's, let's just imagine that. yeah and say for example evolution was like no i don't really want to ima- see this thing so i'm just gonna replace these this five-dimensional staircase by stairs right and your fitness function might be what your eyes perceive to be stairs right right it's still the case that you have to, if you the stairs are there whether we see them in one way we see them in another way the underlying structure that is those stairs is still real and donald hoffman believes that so he says don't get me wrong it might be some crazy complicated thing that we don't understand but fundamentally there's something there there is something there so yeah. the rat would also have to uh, expect so the consensus is forced on us yeah. because 
it's there. It's it's an underlying reality. So then, then when you say so, let's say it's a five-dimensional vector, mm-hmm. or even let's make it even trippier, it's twelve-dimensional vector. Yeah. Um, there's got to be some sort of plane. Like we we see the fitness function of the simplest interpretation of that. Yeah. So it's like our eyes are like, oh, these are stairs. Yeah, yeah. But there's still got to be some sort of maybe there's still got to be some sort of area in which all organisms still you know maybe before the fitness function actually happens still perceive that in 12 dimensional space because they still all have to come to the same conclusion you know yeah but so like so f- l- let me give you an example right say this whatever this representation of the stairs is right whatever rep- it, it has the property that if it is struck by something hard it will reflect it so if you throw yeah, a tennis yeah. ball it will reflect it right the ball might also be some other strange representation but both these representations respect the bouncing off the wall dynamic right right so imagine you and the rat see totally different worlds so your fitness functions are yeah extremely different so let's take us and birds or yeah. bees who see different spectrums of light yeah so even though you're representations of how you see the world based on your fitness functions are extremely different um, the effects of interactions of objects in the world will be consistent within your representations yeah so like okay. and that's because of the rules of because some of, of the rules of physics yeah because the, the world is still all that is the case like even if our representations are different the underlying Lying. Things mechanics are still there are, are real and consistent yeah. okay so but now with your ball bouncing example yeah how do you take out time see I uh, <laughs> I don't know how Donald does it dude I honestly don't know how he does it so one thing I was thinking is that perhaps the way he's arguing is that for time not to exist yeah each moment must exist as a as a as a measurement function so me looking at you right now yeah every second before i took this breath and started speaking now that i've started speaking all the moments while i was taking the, that breath are gone they're totally intangible now they they they're not perceivable no one can actually go look and measure at the measure those moments mm. uh the only thing that exists is the current tangible moment which is me yeah formulating my fitness functions view yeah. right and you don't need time because there's no movement through time. There's simply just the now. The end all... of the, the now. Yeah. But the now is just. You know, what I think Donald would say observations. To that? Yeah. Donald would say, "Listen, even if you're your homie Don, hey, it's yeah, like, cool, listen, Don. yeah, yeah, listen, Don. bruh, listen, Doug." <laughs> but he'd be like, "It's all, let me give you an analogy. You'd be like, imagine we we're trying to." Um, figure out how a computer works and we're like yo this trash can thing is like super weird mm. and it's like I don't know how like the mouse can always like move to the trash can so then we try to like think of some explanation of how the computer works in terms of like the trash can or the OS system in general mm. and he'd be like well you're basing your analogy on a on like a so so uh, let me so say for example each moment was like a screenshot of the of, yeah. the, of, yeah. the, of, the, of the screen right so as you move the file from where it is to the trash can, you can imagine taking snapshots at each moment in time, right? Yo, oh, you just made to, me think about something so yeah. interesting. Carry just on. just yeah. imagine that, right? So, yeah, yeah, yeah. And then now imagine you're like, okay, well, like, I'm going to try to explain how the computer works by like looking at how the screen changes in time. He would be like, well, that's not the point because your, your whole representation is an illusion like looking at the computer mm. at different snapshots in time will never mm. help you figure out how the back end works in mm. the same way like Mm-mm. if you just say oh maybe time doesn't exist it's just the now it's still based on a notion of the time interface which has nothing to do with your perception with of what's it. happening in the back end of reality that's that's a really yeah. good analogy actually um and uh, uh, what that made me think of was that your brain and your eyes actually work in frame rates and refresh rates. Oh, really? So you take in 23 individual snapshots per second, and that's why film is 24 frames per second. Is that uh, why it's 24 trick, frames a second? Trick your eyes, and you also have a 60 hertz refresh rate, which means uh, I can't really explain that, but it refreshes 
the screen. So it sort of helps the stitching between images at 60 cycles per second. So you're actually completely right. If you were to take individual screenshots of that mouse moving 23 times per second, mm -hmm. you wouldn't actually gain any information about the motion of the, 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 the back end of reality, yeah. which is a great place to segue into machine vision. Yeah. Because, okay, so now we understand how human eyes work, mm -hmm. as a function of light and retina and whatever, interpretation in the brain. Well, other people do. Other people, yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. We don't understand yeah, shit. Yeah, we just talk shit. <laughs> yeah, yeah. <laughs> but what we can understand is that computers don't work like that. Mm -hmm. So let's say we've created the super AI, right? Mm -hmm. uh, but this exists inside some of one of Amazon's giant server farms. And now we want to take the super AI and we want to be like, okay, cool, be a true independent agent in the world. So put it into an artificial body, it can walk around, it can interact and whatever. That's all quite simple problems to solve. Feeling of sensation um, and whatever. But the problem of sight is way more difficult because how do you create the reality perceiving engine for a machine? Like a like like not the interface, but the actual reality perceiving engine. Yeah. So so what I mean is um, right now computer vision is used a lot for image recognition, mm -hmm. and that all works on pixels. Oh, uh, okay. So you could have a artificial eye that works in the same way as image recognition now works on servers, okay. in that it breaks the world down into. Like millions of numbers, minute pixels yeah. mm -hmm. each each individual part you know if it's if it's let's say an 8k eye that's 8,000 pixels that means if it's looking at a square each there's 8,000 bits of information for it to interpolate into a square you know mm -hmm. um, so that's one way of doing it yeah that's like how computer vision works right now yeah but then now uh, a pixelated interpretation of reality doesn't necessarily mean that machine will arrive at the same consensus as we do about objects and mm. space and time. So another option is that you could create an ocular circuit which may capture the world as a function of, as pixels but may also capture the world mm -hmm. as a function of algorithms. So, as we were saying about the prism of light in the previous episode, you can compute that into functions in a way that a being has, that has never seen a light prism can work backwards and create a perfect light prism with the, the right particles and materials and refraction and so on and so forth. So, if the super AI could perceive the world as those functions, yeah, if Don Hoffman finally gets to his um, completed mechanical uh, understanding of perception and we can reprodu reproduce that algorithmically for an AI, what is that going to mean for us? And is that potentially going to be the super AI that breaks the simulation? That breaks the simulation? Yeah, because I saw an interview with Elon Musk a while ago with Lex Friedman and at the end Lex Friedman asks him what would you ask the super AI and Elon Musk sits there and thinks for a bit and he, uh, he's like I'd ask it what's outside the simulation and that didn't make sense to me mm -hmm. really how a super AI could understand what's outside the simulation until I started understanding Donald Hoffman's theory oh, okay. but so you, you essentially if I get what you're saying you're asking like could we create an AI that understands the back end and not the front end? Exactly. Hmm. Exactly. Because if you think about the paperclip problem, um, and I'm sure we've spoken about this before, but the paperclip problem is... That's a really interesting... An AI that is given a task. <laughs> okay. 
sorry. No, no, I, I just realized, yo, so you saying we should make the paperclip problem just so we can figure out the back end. He's like, click, yeah. turn it off. Yeah, basically. So the paperclip that's, problem just quickly is an AI that's thinking. given a task, let's yeah. say to make paperclips. Yeah. And to complete that task, it starts using all the resources on the planet, all the resources there, and eventually it starts ter- turning the subatomic particles in the universe to paperclips until everything is paperclips. But to do that, it needs to understand the fundamental the f- nature of reality of the back end. And then right at that last minute, just before we were going extinct, we like turn it off. Like now we understand. Now we know physics. what's up, Jay. This is this is what That's, I'm saying. And like this is uh, yeah, essentially you're right on the money of I what like I'm saying. I like you, That's um, and That's an interesting thought. Uh, yeah, it really it trips me out, dude. Because I don't necessarily think. You know, the super AI is just going to be this intangible thing. I think, you know, I think vision and perception is going to be fundamentally important yeah. to to this problem. I am um, this this the, the the one thing that I'll say about all of this is um, have you ever heard of Flatland? No. Is it's this really? So it's a, I think uh, I think the guy that wrote Alice in Wonderland wrote it. Oh. But uh, it, it it it's. You know how like people talk about three dimensions and four dimensions mm-hmm. and like five and like you, you can't imagine a five dimensional space. So he wrote this book to kind of explain how why we can't imagine a fourth dimension. And he imagines this. So imagine you have like a just a straight line mm-hmm. and we call this flatland, mm-hmm. right? And you have citizens of flatland and they just live on flatland. And on flatland you can only move to the left or, or to, to the, the right. right of the straight line. Yeah. Right? And uh, so you could imagine one thing that's happening is that you could only ever see the front or the back of a person. You could never see the other side. Right. Because you see the other side, you'd have to go over them onto the other side. Right. But you can't because you live in flat land. Right? Okay. And that's the description of a one-dimensional land. So on flat land, people can't answer questions like, oh, what does your other side look like? They yeah. can only be like, oh, what does your back or your front look like? And in fact, all you see is a point. Right? Okay. You only see your, your next door neighbor is just the point. Yeah. Right? yeah. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Then you move to 2D land, right? Yeah. And 2D land is a flat plane, right? Now everyone's a 2D planar object, right? Yeah. Now, for example, people can only you can only, they only see the outsides of each other, right? So, for example, imagine you had a square and the square was a person, and all the organs of the person was inside the square. And their skin was the outside of the square, mm. right? So now people, it's it's a bit better now because you can see the four sides of the square. You can mm. move around each other. You can do anything you can do in two-dimensional space. But now imagine a three-dimensional person came and touched the insides of the square, right? The square would freak out. It would be like, what? Someone just touched my heart, right? And <laughs> the problem why, what, the reason why a three-dimensional person can do that is because he has the z-axis. Right. All right. He has this third dimension where he can like touch the inside of the square, right. and that to show the difference between two dimensions and three dimensions. Right. right? And a flatlander, and no, sorry, the the person on the planar graph, can never understand the understand, square. No, the person that touched his heart. He can never understand yeah. how did this person touch my guts. Yeah. Because he has no idea of this third dimension. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Right? In the same sense, a fourth dimensional person could like reach in the fourth dimension and grab your heart. And your heart would just go missing in, in his hand and you'd never see it. But the, the the idea that I'm trying to get at is that um, there's certain fundamental restrictions we have in dimensions of things that we can do, right? And now to go yeah. back to the interface analogy, um, imagine you have an AI that lives in whatever re- place we live, right? Okay. Is it not the same as him living in 3D space and the back end being 4D space, right? Which is to say, it's not immediately obvious that you can go to the back end. Uh-huh, I follow. Right? I follow. So like even if you had the interface of a thing, yeah. right, of a computer, yeah, 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 yeah. It's not immediately obvious that you can go from that back to, to silicon because yeah. they're two different. Yeah, okay, okay. So okay. I I wonder if AIs as a matter of the principles of physics and reality could go to the back end and be like answer questions about what's simulating us because they just it, they can't do it because they live in the same world we live Still in. Live. Right. So then, what if you programmed, if you had an AI that perceived the world in a purely quantum nature? But that's Only. part of our interface, and that's the problem. Physics is part of the interface, right? You'd have to Even go quantum physics as yeah. trippy as it is. You'd have to somehow 
it's basically we all the 2D people and going to the back end as being a 3D person but it's a constraint of our existence. Mm, I hear you. I hear you. That's actually that's that yo dude, I wish you could argue that with Elon Musk actually. That's a good a really good argument. Um but I I mean I, I, but I don't you, to, to, for all that to work, you'd have to buy that the back end actually exists and that. Yeah, yeah. It would just, yeah. Uh, so, um, I, I don't, don't know if I'm necessarily a customer of. I don't have a rebuttal for you. I have to sit and digest your argument for a little bit. But I think next time we will be speaking about how computer vision actually works now. Yeah. And the problems of computer vision and uh, how they can't even get computer vision to be as good as normal vision. True. Have you uh, heard the elephant example? No. Oh, it's so funny. I'll, well, it's, we'll do it yeah, next, we'll time. next time. Yeah. yeah. So thank you for tuning in. Thanks, Pubby, for, we, for some yeah. really interesting discussion. And thank you, Blend Podcasts, for the ability to host and produce this. And we will see you next week. I'm uh, a bit flat because I'm processing what Pubby said. So it's, it's yeah, it's kind of scary. It's deep, dude. Yeah, it's deep. You, you really you, you said some some shit there. Um, <laughs> sweet guys, thank you so much. Cheers. Peace.